Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Selkirk, Manitoba Councillor John Buffy. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for continuously tuning in, downloading, streaming episodes, because you doing that helps us make sure that we get our word out there. So thank you so much for being an active participant on the Cross Border Interviews journey. Now, on to the show. John, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and chatting today. I, I, I want to start with the question I've started all my interviews off, so you're no exception to this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, John? Wow. Um, I think I've, I've always, um, for the longest time, been involved in my community in one way or another. Um, I think it's it started with actually with my boys being involved in hockey, and uh, turned out I wasn't interested in just sitting on the sidelines. I I, I like to get involved, and I became part of the uh, youth hockey organization, and um, I actually ended up being part of that organization for over twenty years, even after my boys were done there. Their, their years of playing. Um, that actually what was what actually led into my involvement in the uh, in, in the council um, in um, uh, and being involved in in, in the, more of the broader community types of things. Uh, we had uh, we had a we had a, a quite a we have still it's still around actually is. Uh, is a is a uh, an arena that is has got uh, is quite well known. It's called the barn, and it is uh, it is very old. It is I I, I think we're 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 pushing close to uh, eighty or ninety years old now. But at the time, uh, there was a push from the current council to uh, take take it down because we had built a, a new arena. And uh, there was a lot of activity going on at the new arena. Uh, the barn was, uh, was showing its age. Um, it was being uh, expensive to maintain. Um, but there was a, a groundswell in the community of wanting to keep the barn open just because it felt it was that two ice services were needed. And uh, I got involved with that groundswell and, and ended up kind of being one of the leaders of it. And through that became exposed to council of the time and making presentations to them and having discussions with counselors. And that really piqued my interest in, in, in their activities, uh, uh, what they were involved in. And I started to see um, areas where I was interested in, in becoming involved. And, uh, um, and as 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 things turned out, I ended up uh, uh, putting my name in and uh, getting elected. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I want to start with sort of the understanding that this shows about why people got involved in municipal politics and the relevance of municipal politics today. Um, you say that you sort of got involved when the barn was going to be torn down and you started making presentations to council. Prior to that experience, had you had experience with municipal governance, with politics, uh, or was it something that was sort of just out of sight, out of mind for you? As long as my garbage was picked up and my water turned on, that's all I was happy about. And then once you got involved and you saw the democratic process play out municipally, then you started to take in more keener interest in the day-to-day uh, -day operations of what the city was going through. Uh Yes, that's very true. Uh, on a municipal level, um, up until that point, you're right. I had not taken a lot of thought or interest in what was going on at, on the municipal level. Um, my family was, uh, my father and my grandfather were always very somewhat involved in politics. Um, 
So they were at the provincial and federal level. Um, I, I, growing up, I was always around it. Um, I was aware of it. Um, it was never discussed with me in particular, but mm-hmm. but being <laughs> being around it and listening to uh, my folks and, and my grandparents talking about it, I, I had an exposure to it. And so I was I was more sort of interested more at the provincial and federal level. So I've always had that sort of leaning, that, that inkling about what was going on um, in politics at that level. And, uh, and so the, the municipal part uh, really never did jump out at me. Uh, it's just like you said, it all kind of seemed to happen. You know, garbage got picked up, you know, the streets got plowed, you know. Um, uh, things just seemed to, seem to happen and um, it all seemed to go well. Um, but, uh, uh, but it was my exposure at that time in those presentations where I got to see really the workings and, and the involvement and, and, and how that all happened. That really piqued my interest. Do you find that today? Looking at, as a councillor who sits as a municipal leader who makes day-to-day decisions, do you see an apathy within the city of Selkirk, because you represent it, but in the larger Canadian uh, picture where municipal politics, there's an apathy when it comes to getting involved or even understanding what issues or what the challenges of municipalities are? Um, interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, hate, I, I hate painting a broad stroke because in the conversations I've had with municipal leaders from across Canada and a few from Manitoba, uh, thankfully, um, I'm hearing that there is an apathy. As long as my water's turned on, like you said, as long as the water's turned on, the uh, garbage picked up, we're okay. Unless there's a major contentious issue in the community, I'm not going to sit in front of my council cha- chambers and watch what the proceedings are uh, like I w- would be watching the House of Commons question period or watching the Legislative Assembly in Winnipeg's uh, question period. Do you see that happening in municipal politics from your perspective? Yes. Yes, I would have to agree with that. Um, Why do you think that is? I would I would say it's it's um, municipal politics are um, are so different than uh, federal provincial because there's no party lines Um, in a a federal provincial. uh, You have people who have longstanding beliefs and party philosophy and party beliefs. And so and, and 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 and. and the exposure, the media exposure for those people that are running at those levels is just so much greater. Uh, so people have much more awareness of what's happening. Uh, the media coverage for municipal politics um, tends to be uh, very local. Uh, and hopefully the local um, uh, media is covering some of the things that are going on um, in your your in your uh, community and your municipality, um, but even that is 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 um, somewhat tentative at times because uh, it depends on. For example, I mean, just recently, I think you're, you're aware of is that a lot of local newspapers have been closing down, um, yeah. and that has really reduced the amount of exposure that uh, that local levels uh, get uh, because of that. And so the, 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 uh, the amount of available uh, 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 coverage uh, in, in local papers is, is, is really reduced. Um, so unless we are really messing up <laughs> and there's something really newsworthy, uh, yeah, there's very little coverage. And therefore, people, for the most part, uh, see things are seem to be working OK. So, yep, they're quite happy. So what was the draw municipally for you? Because you talk about the barn issue uh, being on the table in front of the council and you put your name forward, but that couldn't have been just it. Or was it just it that you saw John's voice, your voice around the council chamber needed to make some of the decisions that the city of Selkirk was going through and you thought this is the best place for me to be uh, in to make those, make my voice heard, but also make the decisions that need to be made. 
Uh, yes, uh, the latter. Uh, I really, uh, I was. Because you, uh, because you talked about how you, you paid attention more provincially. You could have chosen the provincial route, but you chose the municipal route. Correct. Exactly. Um, I think the um, my involvement with the youth hockey uh, really gave me exposure uh, to um, to being involved at and in, in, in making decisions at a level that affected a lot of people uh, and getting comfortable with that and, and, and feeling good about that and the process. I also, at the time, very interestingly, <clears throat> uh, I had a 38 year career at Great West Life. And um, in my latter years there, I was uh, fortunate to make it to a senior management position. And my, Senior vice president at the time was actually a counselor for Headingley. So him and I got to, uh, got to have a lot of good conversations. And so I got some exposure from him to the goings on of, of council and what have you. And one of the things that he really stressed, uh, he said, John, if, you're, if you are thinking about getting involved, he says, one thing to keep in mind, he says, and what I found, he says, is that People really struggle on local councils with separating governance from administration. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and that was one good, really, lesson I think I learned from him and from working at Great West Life and the, at the level I was at, was separating those. And uh, when I had my exposure to, uh, to that, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the arena issue, I saw, I saw that. I saw where, you know, there was counselors, there was, there was the CAO, there was administration, you know, and so there was no clear cut to me. It was like, you know, counselors were very involved at the time, and I wasn't sure who was making decisions, you know, uh, and, and, and when I was sitting there, uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't clear to me. <clears throat> so um, when I had these conversations with with uh, with with my boss at work and uh, an exposure, I thought, you know what, I have developed a lot of good skills working uh, in my career, and I really think that those skills um, would be useful and could help my community. And I honestly believed <laughs> that uh, my involvement would would be uh advantageous to my community would would bring something to the table and that i could really you know benefit our community because i'm a lifelong resident of, of selkirk we moved away for a few years with the company what have you but came back and um you know this is my home this was my family's home um and my parents home and um yeah i wanted to uh to see if i could make it the best it could be now, you, you've had the pleasure of presenting to council and now being the person who's presented to behind the council table. Um, in your time in office, what's been the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself and the biggest learning curve? Because we are seeing municipal leaders or potential municipal leaders starting to step up to the plate to potentially run in the next municipal election across Manitoba, across the country. What advice would you give them like that that uh, your boss gave to you? Would it be the same advice or is there something else that you would say that you, they need to do before they even consider putting their name forward? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are two things uh, two things that i would i would tell people <clears throat> number one is you know is the government governance administration separation really focus on that that is so important um uh just because you know you got elected one day doesn't make you all of a sudden an expert at running a municipality <laughs> and george Cuff is very good at telling people that um, oh, George Cup is really good at telling people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and that's one thing that I, that I, that I think that he's, he's spot on. Uh, and, and it's so true um, is, um, you know, make sure that, you know, you don't, you don't assume that one day you, you're there to make sure that, you know, the, the city is, is hiring good people, has the right people in place uh, to properly run the, the municipality. It's really a corporation. The, the community is a corporation, and that corporation needs a, a proper head that knows what they're doing. You're a board. 
you're sitting there, you're developing policy, uh, what have you, but you're not carrying out the policy. You're making sure that you have the people to carry it out and carry it out properly. So, you know, you know, so important, you know, that you do that. And the other issue that I would remind people of is do not, do not get involved because you have one sore point that there's <laughs> one big issue that, that really is making you crazy that you want to get involved and you want to make right. Um, if you're going there, if you're getting involved um, at the municipal level, because there's one big thing that's really got you down, you know, and that you think that you have to correct, that's not the right reason. You need to be going there because you want to have an overall uh, perspective, an overall want of, of your community for it to flourish and to it to improve. Um, and um, if it's just one, 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 like I say, sore point, that's not the right reason. Municipal councillors are often described as the government of proximity because you are the closest to the people. The decisions you make impact residents the day after you make them. Now, that can weigh on a lot of people's minds and decisions around the council tables because the decisions you make impact people's pocketbooks, impacts the services that they can uh, get at the local library, at the swimming pool, at the parks, so on and so forth. For you, making those tough decisions is part of the job, but making those tough decisions must weigh on someone like yourself and any municipal councillor who has to make them. How do you ensure that when you go into that council chamber every time with the information provided by administration and the feedback you've heard from residents, that you're making the best decision that's going to impact people the most, but with the least impact to their potential pocketbooks because we're going through this massive affordability crisis across this country right now? Good question. Um, that, that is, that is something that absolutely is, um, uh, takes, takes a lot of thinking and thought and, and work. And, um, one of the things that I personally, uh, endeavor to do, is to ensure that there's there's good debate, there's good discussion, that there are you know questions are asked, uh, clarification is gotten, um, so that you you make sure that you have the best information available to you, you know to make the decisions, to make the recommendations that you do. Um, so so making sure that you know that conversation happens and the thought is is given to it. And that you're making those decisions uh, based on the best information that you can have. And once you have that, is giving consideration to the broad spectrum, to what is what is the what is the best decision overall, not to one individual or certain groups of individuals, or you know, what, what's gonna make them happy or what's gonna make, but you know what, sometimes. Sometimes you're not going to make everybody happy, you know, but at the end of the day, it's what's what's best in the long run. What's the end uh, target that you're that you're striving for and um, and how do you get there? Uh, when I first got elected, the CAO at the time, uh, when we came into council, his first comments were to us were welcome to the 50 50 club. <laughs> he says. You are you have just joined an organization that you will make half of the people happy mm -hmm. half of the time and half of the people unhappy half the time. Um, and he says, you know, deal with that. That is that is just the nature of the of the business. Um, but you have to make the best decisions that you feel you can, you know, for for the future of the community. And uh, and that's 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 the endeavor. Uh, on the 50-50 note, does that mean you don't listen to the other 50% of the people you're not going to make happy? Because you as an elected official know that you have to re represent everyone, even the people who did not vote for you. How much respect comes into play when you make those decisions, those tough decisions that you're not just listening to the people in your echo chamber of social media or the coffee groups at the local Tim Hortons? And actually listen to the people who might be frustrated or have concerns with how you voted as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's not a fact of ignoring the other 50%. 
but it's having the uh, the reasoning and the understanding to be able to share with them why you made those decisions. That they may not be happy with the decision, but having the the defensible position that says this is why we did this. This is why we believe it is the best route to take at this time. It may not be you know in your particular best interest at this time, but there's going to be other decisions down the road that may be that way. Um, so uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a higher level uh, direction and need uh, that you 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 need to you need to make sure that you address them. You can't just ignore them. Absolutely. Uh, um, but on the other hand, you can't you can't let it influence what you believe is is the best decision to make. Now you are the local representative. You are there and you go to the grocery store the day after you make the decisions. You don't go off to Winnipeg to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job, but municipal leaders that I've been speaking to, and I want to get your opinion on this are talking about the creeping of provincial and federal jurisdictional issues into the municipal realm, whether it be through downloading or whether it be through unknown under not understanding the jurisdictional roles that each level of government plays from residents when you're out and you're talking to residents are they talking about only municipal issues or is there a, a lack of understanding of where the jurisdictional lines are drawn in the sand that this is a provincial issue, so you talk to your MLA. This is a federal issue, so you talk to your MP. This is a municipal issue, This is so you talk to your mayor or councillor. Or are you seeing more blurring of that sand line and residents just don't care whose jurisdictional issue it is. They want you to fix it because you're the closest to them and you're more accessible. In my own personal experience, um, I've been... I feel pretty fortunate in, in the interactions that I've had that people are pretty understanding of those those lines, that they they appreciate the fact that municipally, uh, on a municipal level, you know, we have certain responsibilities um, with what we're doing with our tax dollars, and that there's then the provincial responsibilities and federal responsibilities. So I'm always very clear with with folks to, to explain to them you know, where their tax dollars are going and, and where they're best spent. And when, when, when there is downloading and it happens, you know, in, in certain instances, you don't um, say John, you don't say <laughs> downloading happens. What? Um, you know, it's um, I have, I have no issues pushing back at all on provincially. Uh, I will go to our MLA, and, you know, and have conversations with them. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to uh, speaking to residents, um, I'll explain the conversations I've had and, and, and then we'll have that discussion about, um, you know, you know, better roads and, uh, better sewers and, you know, better, you know, the quality water and, and what the tax, their tax dollars need to be spent on and how, you know, we can't afford to be, you know, taking their tax dollars and doing, uh, things that the province of the Fed should be doing. And um, uh, I have very rarely had any pushback when I've had those conversations. Are people engaged? Do you find people actually wanting to talk about issues that are facing them? Because we, we see a rise of social media gatherings and chatter on social media, but I, I believe that most people aren't bringing them to the real world and they're not actually addressing these issues with their local representatives. When you're out and people are actually bringing them, are you actually happy that people are actually talking about the issues that they're impacted by instead of just being keyboard warriors and talking about it on social media? <laughs> the million dollar question that's not the million dollar question john <laughs> uh, uh yes those uh, keyboard warriors yes for sure they um, don't exist at all right you yeah you, we, what what is this keyboard warrior i'm talking <laughs> about <laughs> yeah we could we could have a whole nother conversation on that on that topic um uh i like, will you hear it, it, from the residents? Like, like when you're out and about at the grocery store, you talk about yeah. they understand the jurisdictional lines, but are they willing to say, hey, 
John, I, I have an issue about X, this pothole. We need to fix it and you need to help me figure it out because I've contacted City Hall, which I know from being in Selkirk, you have probably one of the best ser customer services I've ever seen because I, I walked in and your front counter staff were amazing. So I'm just putting that out there right now for anyone okay. listening. If you want a good example of good customer services from administration, look at Selkirk. There's my two two second pitch there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you because uh, we on council feel the same way. Um, our, our administration and uh, our CAO, Mr. Nickel, has done an outstanding job on that front for us. Uh, he's created something that uh, helps us as counselors immensely when we're out in the public. Uh, we're able now to uh, direct uh, uh, citizens or even take them there by the hand, you know, and show them how they can interact with their administration, how they can, you know, address those pothole issues and, and what have you. Um, so <clears throat> that that's huge. That, 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 that's that's just so, so important and has uh has done so much good for us in, in that sense. In in just in, but you're still going to have citizens that are still upset. They're still you know still not wanting to, you know, to take advantage of that. They just want you to do something, uh, you know, fix it. Like I don't care, you know, you're you know I voted for you, and you know why aren't you taking care of this for me? You're always going to have people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to get away from that. You do your best to try to help them and understand, you know, uh, how things work and you know, what you can do, what the priorities are for the for the city, uh, how the city is working towards addressing those. Um, uh, you know, Mr. Nickel has has brought in, you know, some uh, just fantastic processes and procedures for us. The asset management program has just been a, a, a godsend as far as I'm concerned in being able to help people understand, um, you know, the, the strategic plan that we put together and how we're working towards that strategic plan, how uh, things are melt. And I've, I've often, you know, sat down with people and, and, and you know, when, when they're really upset is try to help them understand, you know, that, um, yeah, you know what, what you've got is, is an important issue but there are, it's not the only issue that we're dealing with. And, and there's a number of issues of which we're trying to address in the most effective and uh, uh, as quick as possible way as we can. And here's how we're doing it. So it gives us a, it gives us a way to sit down and reason with people. Sometimes they, they agree. Sometimes they don't. Um, I wasn't going to ask this question, but you, you kind of opened the door. So I'm going to slide it in here for a second. <laughs> Um, you, you talk about the individual needs against the, uh, the city's needs because you're there to uh, represent the city as a whole, but you, you, at the end of the day, and you know, this, and I know this, you can't forget about the people's issues and, and you say it may not be the most pressing issue for the city, but to them, it is to mm -hmm. them, that pothole, that's that park, that, uh, the, the issue in front of their house is the most pressing issue to them. So how do you as a counselor and council as a whole, but I want to, we're just talking about you right now. So as you as counselor, ensure that people's voices feel like they're being heard, but at the same time, don't feel like they're being brushed off because so often in our society, I hear stories that, oh, I, I went to talk to my local counselor and they did what all politicians do. They listen to me and they just don't do anything about it. So how do you ensure that people feel like things are actually getting done for the individual as well as the city uh, the city issues as well? For me, my approach has always been is um, ensure um, there is follow up with the individual yeah. that I don't just I just don't redirect somebody to say, you know, go 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 in go to the city online you know and go to our you know our service request and fill this out and um you know what uh, somebody will get back to you that to me is the worst thing you can do is is just you know walk away and uh, you know give them give them my my i've always you know taken them there help them to fill out that service request but then do a follow up with them afterwards you know how did you how did that request get answered for you were you happy with that answer okay what weren't you happy with how can i help you to you know to be happier even though it's not going to happen you know are you at least you know comfortable with, 
you know, was the was the explanation reasonable? Um, and and work with them. So it's always to me, it's always that follow up with them, and uh, and trying to help them understand where in the big picture is is their particular problem, and um, and and um, when could they possibly you know envision it being taken care of um, in the whole scheme of things. Uh, so to me, I, I've always been I've always been very I feel um, successful in in helping people in that sense. Um, and so that's worked well for me. One last question before I turn to the city as a whole here. Um, now, you you you're well known in your community. You've been active in non uh, in community groups for some time, and now you're an elected official. So I can imagine that when you go to the grocery store, you're not just going as John. You're going as counselor. When you go out to a community event, you're not going as John, you're going as counselor. When you go out to anywhere with family, you're going as counselor. Now, your job is not full time, but it is full time. as is not a full time pay job, but it's a full time job. Um, right. Have you found the balance to be able to be counselor 24 7 while still trying to get some grasp of just being John out in the public with your family when you're out there? I have the most um, positive experience that you can imagine. And I would say that the majority of that positive experience has been related to the fact that I am uh, I come from a large family. I'm a, the oldest of seven children. Um, I have brothers and sisters and, in Selkirk. Um, who have also been involved in some level or another in the community. Um, and my brother, uh, very involved in the hockey uh, um, community, involved in playing and, and what have you. My sister, uh, youngest sister, worked at Safeway for, for over 38 years, so knows everybody in Selkirk. Uh, uh, my wife uh, worked at the local uh, insurance broker. Uh, no, so when people see me, they see me definitely as John, uh, as a Buffy, uh, as as a, as a part of a bigger uh, a bigger family. Uh, people that they've had exposure if they haven't had exposure directly with me, they've had exposure to my sister, my wife, my brother, or somewhere along the line. And fortunately, uh, it's always, for the most part, been positive exposures. <laughs> so. Caveat uh, on the to, most of the time, right there. <laughs> most of the time. Um, so uh, that has uh, served me well. That has served me very well. So that when I go in the community now, and, uh, and especially, you know, being in, uh, on council for as long as I have, um, I'm very comfortable. I'm very comfortable in interactions with people uh, as, as being on a, on a council level and, and, and being just as a, as a as John Buffy, uh, myself, um, there have when been. Was, there always sorry, is, when was your first was, election? Pardon me. When was your first election? Two thousand and two. Okay, you've been on council for over twenty one years now. I'm going to yeah. ask this question, and I apologize if it comes out of left field while you're answering that last question. But has the role of being a counselor changed in those twenty years? Ah. Uh, no, no, I don't believe so. I honestly don't. Um, the experience has changed. The experience changes because of um, who you're on council with, um, uh, who the mayor is, uh, who your fellow counselors are. So your experience changes. Um, but the role to me has always been the same. I've always you know, stood by and lived by the uh, the governance versus administration, the uh, decisions made being made um, are you know with the focus of the community as a whole, um, and so I've always held those very near and dear, and, uh, and and stuck with those values. And to me, that that the role of governance and administration to me really helps to anchor you, you know, and carry you through. Um, and, uh, so that role never changes that, that role is very distinct, very clear. And, um, and it's, it's, like I say, it's, 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 it's served me well. 
I want to turn turn to the city of, of Selkirk as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy motion direction of council. This is the councillor's opinion. I don't know why, but we get emails about this question. Here we are. <laughs> um, but councillor, in your opinion... And I have had the pleasure to visit your community. I had the pleasure to sit down with the, your your mayor of your community. But I want to know your opinion now. In your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Selkirk today? I would say the big, to me, uh, my belief is it's the, it's the growth. Uh, we are seeing... Um, uh, growth that we've never experienced in in the past. Uh, we are seeing the development of the housing development of apartments and townhomes uh, of which we have never seen before. Uh, we, we are uh, seriously, I mean, we sit around the council table and we're looking at each other going, where are all these people coming from <laughs> to fill up these, <laughs> these buildings that are being built? Um, we are having uh, an astounding uh, amount of growth, uh, and 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 managing that growth to me is one of the most important things that we as a council can do to make sure. And and and, that, and there's some controversy coming out about that in some of the decisions that we're making, and 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 how we're managing that. And not everybody is is particularly happy about that. But it's our belief that in the in the long term, you know, these decisions are are what are going to serve the community well into the future. So, to me, that management of that growth to me is 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 paramount. Now, as I said, I was just recently in Selkirk over the summer holidays, and uh, I saw that growth up close and personal. Um, Growth comes with services. Growth comes with infrastructure needs. Growth comes with a lot of different challenges in itself. Um, to sort of ask the follow-up to the issues question is, how do you ensure growth happens because growth is good with the understanding that growth in a sustainable way is probably more achievable than just a carte blanche uh, approach to growth where letting everyone come in as they want. So what does what is council doing and yourself doing to ensure that this growth is sustainable in a way that the city isn't being put on its hind foot instead of its forefoot uh, to make sure that the growth is happening and it's happening in a good way instead of being more reactive to the growth? We have uh, we have just you know um, in in recent years uh, done some very specific things in that direction. Um, the number one was the infill housing that we've uh, um, opened up for. So thirty three foot lots, for example, uh, we have them now um, uh, sprouting up all over the place. We we've ensured that that's allowed to happen. Uh, we've allowed the zoning, you know, to change to support that. Um, that has not been a real popular thing, you know, in certain neighborhoods. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you talk about that um, infrastructure, that sustainable growth, um, you know, being able to have uh, more tax dollars supporting the same, you know, sewers and, and water lines, what have you, is just the right thing to do. Is that densification, you know, of the population is important. Uh, we've also recently uh, done some land banking. We have bought a um, uh, property out on the uh, outskirts of the of the community, of which we we saw an opportunity, and we will now we now have the opportunity to control the development there. We won't do the development, but what we will be able to do is be able to award the contracts, award um, purchase of that property to the contractors that are willing to do um, the right development, the development that we think is proper to do out there. So you know, that's been a really important you know, step that we've taken. Um, we've also taken some, uh, I would say very, um, uh, some decisions that aren't so popular. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an apartment block that's going up um, in, a, in, a, in a street down in our community that's not a popular place, but 
uh, we have taken sort of we have taken we have taken the position that uh, as much as some people aren't happy about it, it's important uh, long term because again, it provides that densification. It's a it's a building that's going to go up uh, close to our downtown, so people will actually be able to live in that apartment block and be able to walk to their services. They'll be able to walk to grocery stores, to drug stores, to shopping, to the conveniences that they they won't need a vehicle if they don't want to take a vehicle, um, and you know. Not, not particularly um, popular with some folks, but uh, um, at the end of the day, on the long term, it's the right thing to do. So those are the types of decisions that I believe, you know, we're making, you know, uh, for that type of long term sustainability of growth. Now, I'm, I'm going to pick up on a, for, uh, a question that I asked earlier on, but ask it about the issues as well. Now, you probably hear about issues on a constant basis, whether it be small individual issues or citywide issues. You as council and as a councillor have to sort of weed through all the issues because you know and I know that municipalities do not have an unlimited supply of money to be able to help everyone with their issues the, every year. And you, at the end of the day, have to make the tough choices to say, OK, these are the issues that are going to be addressed. And we're going to upset John down the street for me or Sarah down the street for me or Fred three neighborhoods over from me because their issue is just not as important as these other issues. Is communication key to your job to make sure that when you make those tough choices to say, unfortunately, we're unable to do what you want this year, asset management has it in the queue of things that we're going to get to three, four years down the line, but I, I'm going to have the tough conversation and I maybe upset you, but I need to be able to be honest with you about the challenges and your issue may be important and it is important. But right now, it's not important to the larger scale of things because we just don't have enough money. Absolutely, that is that is that is the that is so important to have that conversation, have those conversations, and and I and I think I mentioned it before is having that conversation to help people understand, to help them understand that as you say, their their issue is important. It's not that it's not important. But just in the in the in the in the list of things that need to be done, here's where it falls. Here's the here's the priority. Um, here's where it, 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 we're hoping to make it happen. Um, and that's an that, you know, and just to touch on uh, on the communication aspect, um, that is something else that uh, Mr. Nickel has just been outstanding at is developing um, the communications uh, of of city <clears throat> of council with the public. Um, the, the type of communication um, programs that he's developed, uh, that he's put out there, have just, you know, in my 20 years on council, um, we've never had that type of, uh, uh, of push of information, of availability of information for people to know what's going on in the community, where their dollars are being spent, the type of development that's happening. So a lot of people that are asking those questions are also looking at that. So they have some background already. They already have some sense of where the community is going, where money is being spent. And that makes our conversations a whole lot easier. It really does. I have to ask the question because you opened up the communication door. I love when counselors and my guests make it my job so much easier to ask these questions. Communication can only go as far. As a former communications person, I know that you can blanket communications with all the information you have, whether it be social media, whether it be radio, television, uh, the print, uh, anything, or even go door to door. There's always going to be people that are in your community that say, I didn't know. I didn't hear about it. I don't know. I didn't know this decision was being made. Um, how far does communication have to go to make sure that you've done your job correctly when you're making important decisions? Because you can go ask 100 people, but there's always going to be people who's like, well, you didn't ask me. Why is my opinion not more important than this opinion? So for communications for you, how far does communication have to go before you have to say, okay, I think I have enough information to make the decisions that I need to around the council chambers? Or even on the flip side of that, how important is communications to make sure you say, 
We've done our best to get the information out there after we've made this decision. And it's up to the residents because we only can go 98% of the way. Residents still have to go the 2% to search out and even research some of this information as well. I'm 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 more in the latter where okay. I believe that there there is some responsibility on on part of the uh, residents. Um, <clears throat> what we've <Ditto>. created, uh, <laughs> what our administration has put out there, has been every opportunity uh, for you as a resident to keep up to date to know what's going on. And so again, it, it as counselors, we're able to point people in those directions to give them that where they can go to get that information. Um, if they didn't know about it, fair enough. You know, they weren't aware of it. Uh, that's fair. But you know about it now. So here it is. You know, you can keep up to date on, on what's going on. Here's the place where you can get that information. Um, I, I'll give you the information that you feel you don't have at this point. Um, but you here are the opportunities that you have had to for to provide input, to get the information. So, you know, in the future, um, you know, here it is, you know, so yes, I believe that there is some definitely responsibility on the resident side to, uh, to consume some of that and to stay, stay up to date with it. I just looked at the time and I realized we're at the 40 minute mark and I have not even got to our se a third segment now, but I'm going to ask it right now because I know you're a busy person and I, w I don't want to take up time that you probably have to spend on reading reports or doing other council related <laughs> issues. So I want to talk about an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And as someone who's just recently Selkirk and as I feel like I've only scratched the surface on what Selkirk has to offer around tourism, I want to ask you point blank, in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems that tourists or people of Manitoba need to see if they come through Selkirk potentially next spring or potentially whenever they're coming through? So I hope this is this is appropriate because uh, I I, uh, <clears throat> I I wanted to be prepared for a question like this. So I happened to ask our administration if they could give me some highlights. I love it. Because <laughs> I don't want to miss anything. You read it off. as you, You're not the first counselor and you won't be the last. <laughs> so they gave me, I, I didn't want to miss anything. And so they gave me this list and I was going through it last night. And <laughs> I was, I astounded myself. They had they have listed forty three different items of interest for tourism, um, and and I'm going through it last night and I'm going wow I forgot about that oh yeah I forgot about that I mean it just this the city of Selkirk this community is absolutely uh, rich in in activities in 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 sites and environments. Um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, let me get away from from the fact that I cheated a bit on the, on getting the list. Uh, I can tell you that the the Selkirk Park. When I was working, you know, I lived in Selkirk, worked in Winnipeg. All kinds of friends, uh, work friends, of course. And I used to have work friends that would come out to Selkirk and uh, happen to come across the Selkirk Park and come back to work and tell me, "Oh my goodness, what a beautiful park!" We didn't know that was there. What a wonderful place with that huge, you know, uh, campgrounds and swimming pool and what have you. Um, you know, people people were just astounded by it. Uh, so to me, that Selkirk Park, you know, is is a real gem for the community. It really is. Um, people go down there and they camp there uh, with their trailers, you know, all summer long. We have. Um, I'm on the board. I think that the Selkirk Marine Museum is, is just an outstanding, outstanding facility that people can come to. Uh, we have such a great um, um, volunteer board that works there. We have some people that have developed um, some of the uh, museum um, artifacts. Uh, uh, they've developed uh, things for people to come and see. They, they're, they're doing constant updates to it. So, I mean, you come there, every couple of years and you're going to see something different, which is, which is really fantastic. Um, I, there is there, we have, uh, we have a new Christmas, um, um, 
Oh, what's it called? Um, I, I heard Christmas, so I'm all excited now. So you better this better be an amazing thing. <laughs> uh, where is it? The um, it's the it's the it's the I'm gonna find the the actual name of it because it's a um, Manitoba Avenue. Every 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 business has Christmas lights on it, and we have a special day for lighting it up. So Manitoba Avenue, our main business core area, the street is closed and um, there are events. Um, um, it's kind of like the parade of lights is what's okay. going on. And um, there's all kinds of events that are put on, evening events that are put on. So it's a it's a special gathering right at Christmas time that's been created. Um, and uh, it's it's only been it's only about been about four or five years old now. And uh, it's become become extremely extremely popular. Um, we have a Canada Day event. We have <laughs> we have a waterfront, and I, I hope you got down to see the waterfront that we have. There was we had some visionaries back a number of years ago that took that wharf that it was a it was a federal wharf at one time, and transformed that into a community gathering area. That is just phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I would compare it, you know, compared to what Winnipeg did with the Forks, in in obviously not quite the same, you know, size, you know, but certainly the same draw. And we have a Canada Day event every year down there with a fireworks display that is second to none. It is wow. we bring we bring in, uh, I, I can't remember the number, but it's 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 literally thousands of people that come to see that fireworks display. Um, so it, it's quite the gathering. Um, the Marine Museum, as I mentioned, has, has a, we have a, um, a Halloween uh, 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 event that goes on on the ships. And the staff do a Halloween uh, ghost tour on, on these ships every year. That is just awesome. absolutely amazing. It is amazing what they do. If you ever walk through those ships in the dark, Trust me, <laughs> you better have a good heart because you're <laughs> you're 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 going to be startled on a number of events. Uh, it is just it is, it is outstanding what they do with the effects, the volunteers that get involved, the people that get dressed up for that event. Um, it, it it's just amazing. Uh, so uh, yeah. I want to I want to ask you point blank then, it, it, where do you go? Where's your sort of refocused area where you can go after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of being involved in the community to just let it all escape your mind and refocus yourself because you know tomorrow is another day and tomorrow you're going to be back at doing with the same issues. So one of the other, uh, I believe, gems of our community is our golf course. The Selkirk Golf Course is... Um, Anybody that comes to play that golf course falls in love with it. It's it's a it's a hundred year old golf course. It's uh, started out as nine holes, went to eighteen holes. I'm an avid golfer, and that's my escape. That's where I go. I will go down there and go in the evening. Just go in the evening. I'll take a cart, just myself, and I'll go out on the golf course and uh, just you know play a few holes, play play a couple of golf balls myself. And I'm just in my own space, my own world. And it's just, it's just a, it's a beautiful place to be. And just, a, uh, that's my, that's my, my place to escape. So what I'm hearing is Chris and uh, John are going to be going golfing next summer. You betcha, buddy. <laughs> You're a golfer. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, so I'm going to end on the last question and it's the million dollar because I am cautious of time here. And I want to ask the biggest question I think I ask all municipal leaders. In your opinion, what makes the city of Selkirk such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? To me, it's, it's, it's the community. It's the community that has been developed. It's the community events that we've seen happen. It's the, um, it's the, um, parade of lights at Christmas. It's the Christmas parade that we have. It's the, the annual Selkirk fair and rodeo. It's the amenities that people can come and, um, uh, their children, there's, there's, there's activities for their children. There's places for them to, 
uh, to grow. There's um, there are community events that they can involved with and, and share with their neighbors and share with their friends and bring bring family to uh, to get involved in. Um, it's a it's a it's a place where I believe that is seeing as we talked about is seeing growth is seeing um, uh, um, advantages and and we're and we're and we're thirty minutes away from Winnipeg. We're thirty minutes away from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, the Winnipeg Jets. You know the theater, you know the opera, you know whatever you want to to get involved with. But then you you know thirty minutes away, you come back home to your small your small city, your small community, and I, I believe that 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 to me is is the real draw. I want to thank you so much, John, for sitting down and doing this. This has been a fantastic, lighthearted conversation, which I think we need more often in our society. So thank you so much for A, serving your community, because I don't think municipal councillors get enough to do because you actually make the tough decisions. So thank you. But also thank you to me for uh, joining me on the show and just chatting about yourself and the city of Selkirk. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.